Okay, I wanna welcome everybody to Building a Startup Budget. It is part of our Business Foundation series, uh, which are a group of webinars that we offer that we feel are the basics to business that every business owner should have. Uh, we have Michael Sandman with us today. He is a SCORE Boston mentor and has presented this topic for us in the past and does a great job. So we're um, looking forward to sharing the information and knowledge that he has with you. Um, you'll see that we have some of our social media links up there. Uh, we definitely consider following us. We are working on posting inform, you know, little um, preview videos for upcoming uh, webinars we have. We're putting little clips of some of our mentors uh, in there, and we're also featuring some of our, our client successes as well. So um, it might be something fun for you. Uh, first, we're going to talk about what SCORED offers and what we do. Uh, we have obviously the training that we have right now. And we also have uh, websites that are full of um, free business information, templates you can download. And actually this webinar, there's templates for this webinar there that you can download and lots of resources that you can read up on. Uh, the most important thing that we do is, how, however, is the mentoring. Our mentors are volunteers. They come to us with a variety of knowledge bases and backgrounds to work with uh, business clients. Our business clients are in beginning stages and trying to decide if business ownership is right for them. They're in that planning phase where they're laying out all the everything they need to know to get started. And we have people that are already in business and people come to us seeking advice and direction on any business topic you can imagine, marketing, um, keeping their books, work-life balance, um, just anything you can imagine, people come to us. And uh, we have a mentor that can help you, uh, whether it's from our own chapter, from the district-wide database, or from the database nationally. Uh, the first session is in usually around that 45-minute range. They want to know a about you. They want to know what your goals are, what your challenges are, and work to find a plan and a solution to help you keep moving forward. So I definitely encourage you to reach out and get a SCORE mentor if you don't already have one. Uh, you can also go to the score.org website and put in your zip code in, into there and uh, it'll t match you to the chapter that's nearest you. Uh, there are listed at the bottom there, the chapters that are in our district. Uh, we do anticipate a good crowd today. So we are gonna use that Q and A tab. It's on your Zoom bar, Q and A. Um, that's where you're gonna submit questions you have for the presenter today. Uh, everything else can go into chat, but if you have a question you want asked to the presenter, put it in that Q&A tab and we will try to get to as many questions as we possibly can. So I'm going to pull my screen down and give um, Mike a chance to get his up okay. and uh, we get started. Okay, there we go. Um, okay. So I'm uh, Mike Sandman, and uh, I live in uh, in the Boston area. I'm part, part of the Boston chapter, and have been since uh, I think uh, 2015. And we're going to walk through uh, building a startup budget. We're going to use a uh, an Excel spreadsheet that has a number of tabs, and we're going to go through it through one tab at a time. Uh, and it's you can get this uh, uh, this spreadsheet in uh, an Excel format or and it'll run on uh, 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 either Apple or Google's equivalent of, uh, of Excel uh, and work through it yourselves. The business that we're going to be looking at is uh, a tree nursery. And we've chosen that because it sounds like a fairly straightforward business, but it's a bit complex because it requires some inventory and some uh, investment in in capital equipment and real estate, uh, and most of uh, most of the businesses that are formed are actually simpler than that. Uh, but we we're using this, and of course, if yours is simpler, then there are some things that you can skip uh, as we uh, as we go through. But we're going to put this whole thing together, and at the end, uh, uh, we'll have a startup budget, a cash flow projection. We'll talk about how to do sales projections and so forth. 
And all the way along, if there's anything that you don't um, uh, don't understand, uh, then please be sure to ask uh, in the Q and A, or if you have a, a you know a technical question, anything of that sort. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody's able to follow this uh, without any difficulty. So let's just talk about uh, money and the numbers that are on financial statements and so forth, because sometimes people uh, confuse um, revenue or sales uh, with uh, with uh, what the, the profit of a business. So somebody will say a business is, uh, well, I expect to have, you know, X amount of dollars uh, as that X amount of dollars at the end. So revenue is what customers or clients pay you. And net revenue or sales is what's left after any returns or allowances. Uh, and if, if you're providing a service, typically that's returns and allowances are not, uh, are not a factor. But if you're providing a product, sometimes a, a customer will bring something back and you give them a refund. So the net revenue is how much money comes in from customers after uh, any returns uh, of that sort. Expenses are costs are everything you pay to run the business. And that's a pretty wide range of things. There are some startup costs that happen just once. And we'll talk about those right at the beginning. What equipment that you need, if you have to build out uh, a, a retail space, um, if you need some legal documents or something of that sort, um, those are startup costs. They happen once. Uh, and it's really important to know what those costs are going to be before you get going. And then there are fixed expenses, things that once you start, rent, uh, web hosting, insurance, telephone, um, they're fixed because they continue whether revenue goes up or down. Uh, and generally speaking, within a, a, a range of revenue, your fixed expenses stay about the same. Um, as you grow and you need more space, um, <clears throat> or you need more insurance or whatever it is that you need that's additional, some help, uh, then those fixed expenses <clears throat> excuse me, uh, will uh, we'll sort of step up. Um, variable expenses are the things that you pay for as a part of what you're selling. So labor, including yours, it's very important to, uh, to remember that you have to get paid just like your employees do. Parts and supplies, uh, supplies that you, that you use in terms if you're putting a product together or something like that. Inventory, if you're bringing in uh, products to, uh, to work with, those expenses are variable because they go up and down depending on revenue. Uh, so you shouldn't be spending a lot of, uh, of money on labor at the very beginning of the business because you don't have very much revenue. As the business grows, um, the cost of labor will also increase because you'll bring in uh, more people and, and they'll spend more hours, uh, hopefully. So profit is what's left over after all of those expenses are paid. So revenue minus expenses equals profit. And what we're aiming for is a business that shows some profit, but perhaps even more important, we want to make sure that the business is able to throw off enough cash so that you can take out the salary, the wages that you need to live and your employees can as well. Okay, so... We're going to go through a, 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 almost an hour's worth of, uh, of discussing uh, startup budgeting. Why bother? Well, one thing is at the very beginning, you need to figure out whether the business will enable you to reach your personal income goals. Is this business going to pay me enough so that uh, I can support myself and my family? How, uh, figure out how much money you need to start up or to expand. So remember I said there are some startup expenses that's separate from the costs of uh, running the business on an ongoing basis. And if you need a lot of uh, money or even a moderate amount of money to start up, um, you should uh, you should make sure that you know where that money is coming from. Um, you have to get an understanding of the financial risks and rewards. Uh, and uh, you can identify both development, product development, service development, and startup costs and ongoing expenses. Um, and if you're looking for somebody to help you out, uh, if the money is coming from family or from a nonprofit lender or from a bank or whoever it is that's, uh, that's providing uh, the capital that you need, the money that you need to get started, they want to see all of these numbers. Uh, so this is intended to provide a plan that will help guide your decisions and help you monitor results. 
and help you show other people what you're doing or what you're planning to do and how it's going. So common concerns that people have when they go through this, these spreadsheets look complicated. I don't think I can do this on my own. Um, and I don't all understand all the figures and the math and it's, it's really overwhelming. Come in and talk to a SCORE mentor and they can help you do this work. Uh, you're gonna have to fill out the spreadsheets and do the legwork to figure out what your costs are gonna be, but you can get guidance in how to do it and, uh, and uncomplicate some of this. And as I say, we're looking at a business that's a little bit complicated. And so uh, it's, uh, it may be in fact more complicated than your own business uh, if you're not uh, investing in, uh, in real estate and equipment in particular and inventory. Um, so, uh, can I start without a financial projection model? Yes, but you really shouldn't do that because you, you need to know how much money you're going to need to get the business off the ground. And this, uh, this hour and, uh, and the spreadsheet and so forth will, uh, will help you do that. So you really can do this and SCORE mentors can help you uh, to get through the, uh, the, uh, the mechanical part of it. Okay. So the example we're gonna use, as I said, is a tree nursery. It produces specimen trees, shrubs, and vines. And so a specimen tree is the sort of tree that you might plant uh, on the front lawn, uh, maybe a Japanese maple or a lilac or something of that sort, um, uh, or you know, somewhere on your property. Uh, the, you, you get those from a landscaper or from a, sometimes from, uh, you go directly to a, 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 a a, a, a seller of, uh, of shrubs and trees and so forth. Um, but uh, that's the, the product that uh, Anne is going to be selling. And she's looking to sell. She, she has a goal of $710,000 at the end of her third year, uh, third year sales, which means she's going to have less than that in the first and second year. And we'll, we'll talk about how we get a sales estimate and how important it is to, to do that estimate. And her customers are mostly florists, landscapers to some extent, and consumers. Um, so she's got a couple of different kinds of customers. She'll have a, a number of different products here. Um, and so she has to figure out, you know, what does she need to, to do all of this? Uh, we're going to go through six tabs here. Um, and these worksheets will go through how much money she needs to start, what the salaries and wages are that she's going to be uh, facing as a fixed expense, an ongoing expense, or fixed operating expenses. So things like rent and insurance and uh, interest payments if she's borrowed money, um, a sales forecast, and we're going to go through uh, that in some detail. And finally, a cash receipts and, and disbursements sheet that is a cash flow. Um, and the template that we have um, will work, as I said, on Google Sheets. They'll work on numbers uh, just as well as on, uh, on Excel. So let's talk about startup funds. So let's think about what a plant nursery needs. Uh, different types of business, different startup expenses. Think about your own business, how much do you need and where it's going to come from and what you're going to do with it. And be sure to include things like starting inventory and the labor that goes into getting started. Uh, before you uh, can service a customer, um, that salaries, taxes, benefits, even before you make the first sale. So with uh, this, she's going to be growing um, uh, trees and shrubs. She needs land. Um, she needs a uh, building uh, to, uh, uh, to house all of the equipment that she needs to maintain the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the basically tree farm that she's got. Um, she's going to have to make some improvements in that building. Those are called leasehold improvements. She'll need some equipment and some furniture and a delivery van. And so her total fixed assets that she needs to buy are come out to $172,000. And again, think about your own business. If you have a storefront, for example, you're going to have to put some money into counters, uh, display cases, and, and so forth. That's the kind of thing that goes into this part of the uh, of the package. And then she needs some operating capital, the starting inventory and labor costs. So before she even gets started, well, she says she doesn't need any salaries and wages, uh, but um, uh, she does have to have some insurance. Um, she needs to buy some inventory. 
uh, quite a bit of it. She'll lead some legal and accounting fees, a utility deposit. Um, she's not renting because she's got her own property that she's buying. Uh, but uh, if you're renting, then you may have to make a rental deposit uh, and a utility deposit and so forth. And so uh, she wants to have $3,000 cash on hand before she gets going. So her total operating capital is $41,800. So to get this business off the ground, she needs a pretty good chunk of money, $213,800. So a lot of businesses will start with way less capital than this, way less need for money. But just the same, every business goes through the, you should, you should go through the same thinking process. What do I need in the way of fixed assets, things that I absolutely need in order to get this business going? And what are the expenses that I'll incur in order to get it off the ground? So that's our first chunk. So now let's talk about labor, uh, including hers. And again, it's really important to include your own labor. And she's set herself a fairly low wage to begin with, uh, $25 an hour. And she's figuring that she'll need three full-time employees once she gets going and she expects to pay them $17.50 an hour. Uh, and so her total in terms of salary and wages uh, comes out to um, uh, 40 hours a week for, for, those, uh, for herself and her employees, and the estimated pay at the end of the month, because we're gonna do this on a monthly basis, is 40, she's gonna take out $4,333, and her employees are gonna go home with uh, or she's going to have to put out for them $9,100, $9,100. So she knows that on a monthly basis, she'll have to pay salaries of $13,433. And you have to remember that on top of salaries, you have to pay some taxes and fringe benefits. So Social Security is 6.2%. That's the employer's share. Um, Medicare is 1.45%. Again, that's the employer's share and unemployment taxes, state and federal. Um, if she has, a, 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 she's going to have a, a pension. Of, actually, it's, she's probably going to have a 401k plan for her employees, and she's going to set aside some money for that. Um, so her total costs here are $1,500. So in, in addition to that $13,433, she needs another $1,500 per month to cover her salaries and wages, uh, 14943 almost $15,000 uh, on a monthly basis once she gets going. Okay, um, operating expenses. So uh, we talked about some expenses being fixed, like um, advertising is probably, you start off, uh, and that's probably a fixed expense and car and truck expenses. And then some are going to be variable. Let's take a look. So here are her advertising, car and truck expenses, commissions, insurance, and so forth. And if you're starting a business or running a business, you're going to have some of these things. You're not going to necessarily have them all. There are some things here that are not that, that I'm sorry, there may be some things in your business that aren't listed here. When you're putting this together, you know the business and you, you, you'll have an idea, uh, presumably, of what's required. You may add some some lines uh, for uh, for these expenses, and that's that's perfectly fine. In fact, that's really important to do to make sure that you've got that tuned the right way. So, uh, on a monthly basis, again in the month of January, she figures she'll need forty three hundred dollars uh, when she uh, when she starts this business on January first for her operating expenses. That's on top of the fifteen thousand dollars. Uh, that she knows she's going to pay out in uh, in wages. Okay, let's talk about sales uh, because it's the sales that are going to cover all of those costs. And it takes time to get that first sale and more time to build sales volume. So if you think that your business is going to get off the ground and you're going to sell, I don't know, um, $120,000 at the end of the year, the chances are that you're not going to sell that in $10,000 in the first month, $10,000 in the second, $10,000 in the third. It takes time to build up. Uh, and uh, so you have to be realistic about how much time it takes. Look at other businesses who uh, are, uh, are doing the same thing. 
ask people who work in the same sort of business, how long did it take you to get started? Um, how many months was it before you uh, came up to a, a stable level of, uh, of revenue that was enough to support the business? And you have to build a month by month sales projection. And the chances are you'll find that you, at the very beginning, you need cash to put into the business to keep it going um, before the sales, the revenue, cover all of your expenses. And at the very end of this, we're going to work through uh, that cash flow projection so that you can see how much she needs, how much Ann needs uh, on a, uh, at the beginning of her operation. And that, that will provide a template for you to do the same thing for your own business. She has, I'll, I'll stop there for a second, make sure that that's, that's absorbed. Okay. Um, she has uh, three kinds of, of customers. She's going to sell direct to local retailers. She's going to try to sell to more distant retailers through representatives, sales representatives. And she's going to sell through the internet to uh, end consumers. So she's She's not going to operate a, a, a business where people come to her, pick up a plant and put it in the back of their car and drive it home. Uh, she's going to offer that through uh, through uh, Internet sales. And uh, in fact, if you are at all interested in gardening, you know that there are some uh, some businesses that do that. They operate. They sell um, uh, bulb, tulip bulbs and daffodil bulbs and plants and so forth over there. Uh, from their website, and they you, you never go there. They they send them to you uh, uh, by UPS. So that's her her business model. Those three categories of uh, of sales. So, what kind of you know how do we forecast sales units? What are we selling? Are we selling products? Are we selling services in either by the hour or for a fixed price? Um, some combination of products and services. What makes up your unit of sale? And then what's your cost for that unit? And what do you have to charge in order to make a profit uh, on, that, uh, on, on that sale? That's what we have to figure out. And we're going to walk through that for, uh, for her business. So um, let's uh, look at one of the products. Um, a, a plant mix, uh, and um, honestly, I have no idea what is in that plant mix, but it ha it's a pretty heavy cost. It's uh, it, it, she's expecting that over the course of a year, she'll sell 125 of these bags, and the total sales will be $250,000. That means that each one of them sells for $2,000. So that's a pretty big product, whatever that is. Um, she's certainly going to need a man to uh, to deliver that. Uh, but in the beginning of January, she says to herself, you know, I've talked to other people who've done this. Um, we know that this is a seasonal business, a tree nursery. Um, we're only going to sell, let's say, a half a dozen of these in January. So I'm expecting my total sales for the year to be 250000 but only 11000 uh, is going to be in, uh, in January. And I know that it costs me... Um, uh, uh, $6,050 for that $11,000 worth of sales. I know that my unit price uh, that I'm paying for, my unit cost that I'm, that I'm paying my supplier um, is, um, uh, well, in this case, it's a, a little bit over $1,000. So my total margin uh, before all of my operating costs is $4,950. So that's my gross margin. That's what that's called. And this number is cost of goods sold uh, is $6,000. So it's not her profit. Her operating costs still have to come out of that including the labor and all of the ongoing costs that we talked about, uh, insurance and so forth. So obviously she's going to sell a, a fair amount more in order to, to make a profit. So let's look at are three different kinds of products here. Uh, a plant mix, a plant mix that she sells uh, over the internet. It's a smaller quantity. She's going to deliver it by a truck. Um, and the ones that she sells uh, through her representatives uh, to distant nurseries. And again, she packages those differently. Um, and her um, sales uh, per unit of $2,000 for the plant mix, as we said, um, it's $100 for 
the smaller mix that she sells over the web and a thousand dollars for the distant nursery. She, this is her cost of goods sold. This is what she pays her suppliers. Um, if she was raising these from scratch for herself, this would be a more complicated number, but let's say that she's got a supplier that uh, she's buying these from. And so her margin per unit is $900, $40, $400, depends on the product. Your products similarly, or your services, will have different margins for different, different uh, kinds of products, assuming you have multiple products and services. So as you say, this is a little bit complex, but let's, let's work it out. And we've got a sales projection here for um, the plant mix. Instead of five, we've got uh, six, rather, in the previous spreadsheet, we've got five um, in January, February, March, and then in April, when the weather begins to get good, it begins to open up. And then sort of middle of the summer, it drops off uh, and picks up again. Maybe people aren't, she feels like, well, people go on vacation or maybe she's going on vacation. We'll close the store, uh, the nursery. Uh, and it tails off towards the end of the year. At the end, that's her 125, but you can see units sold, but you can see that it varies month to month. And so her sales for that product similarly are going to vary from $10,000 all the way up to $40,000. And she'll come up with $250,000 at the very end. But again, there's that curve. Uh, and the cost of goods sold, the same thing. She's going to buy this product pretty much as she needs it. So her margin, what's left over to cover her expenses, will go from $4,500 in January and February and March um, up to 18000 13,500 and so forth. Again, following the seasonal curve. Um, okay. So that's for um, the plant mix. We do the same thing for the smaller the bags that are sold over the internet. She figures it's going to take her a lot longer to get that sales channel started. Um, so it's not until May when she'll begin to get that off the ground and she'll get a bump, uh, she thinks. And then this is the level that she expects to have. And she thinks that this will actually go through the fall uh, before it tails off. And she'll have 570 of these products sold at the end of the year. And you can see the, um, the price. Uh, we had the price up here is $100. So if she sells 50 of them, she'll bring in $5,000. If she sells 200, she'll bring in $20,000. The end of the year, she'll have $57,000 of sales from this this particular product and $34,000 with the cost. So that's her gross margin. And finally, if she's selling to distant nurseries through representatives, she knows that this is going to take a lot longer to get started. So she waits through the first eight months before she expects any sales at all of this category and goes through the same routine um, to figure out what her uh, total revenue is going to be and what a cost of goods sold is going to be and what the margin is going to be. So we add all of that up and you can see that the sales vary enormously from month to month. And again, they get started at a fairly low level and then they build up. And then towards the end of the year, seasonal business and nurseries, they drop off. Now there are businesses where this is just the opposite. Um, for example, if you're in, in certain kinds of retail businesses, you know that October, November, December are the peak months um, and December is a blockbuster month because it's before Christmas. Um, depends on what the business is, but going through this thought process, that's what we want you to do. Go through this thought process for whatever it is that you're selling or intending to sell um, and work out what the likely, reasonable, relatively conservative, month by month uh, numbers are going to be for your sales and therefore how much revenue, how much money you're going to be able to bring in to cover your expenses. So at the beginning, her expenses are, uh, are, are, are you know, we remember, remember we said that her expenses were going to be about $20,000. She has uh, she has a combination of $15,000 more or less of employee expenses and $5,000 of ongoing expenses. Um, so uh, that margin is, you know, she's got to cover $20,000. You can't do that. If your margin is only uh, only forty five hundred, it isn't until she gets uh, along further into the uh, the year uh, that she can begin to cover her um, 
uh, cover her other expenses. Okay, so where do we get information about this? How do we do this projection anyway? Um, unit cost and price, you can get that from, you know, you, you have suppliers if you're buying a product or uh, if you're uh, em employing someone who's going to go out and provide services, you know what you're going to be paying them. Um, you can learn from competitors. Uh, and people say, really, I can learn from competitors? Yeah, you can. If you go in and talk to somebody who's in a similar business, um, especially if they're not in your immediate geographic market. So you're starting a business in Waltham, um, go and talk to somebody in Quincy uh, because you're not likely to be competing with them. Um, and, uh, and maybe somebody else in Worcester and find out, you know, well, what was the startup curve for your business? And, um, you know, what can you tell me about uh, uh, about the rate at which you have to add employees and so forth. Um, you can certainly do that. You can also um, get some help at the Kirstein section of the Boston Public Library where they have reference materials on all kinds of businesses and go and talk to one of the reference librarians there. Um, you can estimate sales volume for in units from news reports about the, uh, the industry in general. Um, you can, hopefully, you've worked in the business for a while yourself before you're trying to start something brand new. Um, and so you'll have some experience. Um, you can observe competitors, you know, stand off and, you know, go into a competitor's uh, uh, a place of business, um, not into, only in, into the public area, and just take a look around. What are their, if they have uh, display cases or they have a counter or uh, something of that sort. Well, what does that look like? And what do, you, what do you have to do? Join a trade association. That's a great way to meet people in the business and learn about the numbers. Um, and then um, you have to estimate using all of these pieces of information, the sales volume that you need in order to make the business proper, profitable and think about um, whether in fact the what you're hearing and what you've learned um, gives you confidence that your sales volume will, in fact, match that number. So it's a matter of making sure that you know what the cost uh, and the uh, sales number is likely to be and what the bottom line is, how much profit is left over. If there's, assuming that there's profit left over, you certainly want some uh, in order to uh, make sure that the business will be profitable and viable uh, over the, the long run. Okay, so those are some sources of information. Uh, if you talk to a, a, a score mentor about the kind of business that you're in, we have people who have been in uh, so many different businesses in, uh, in, in, in uh, across Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Uh, there are so many mentors who have been in different businesses that in all probability, you'll be able to find somebody who's been in the business sort of like the one that you're starting up and they'll be able to help you work through this. Okay, some other things you have to think about. Accounts receivable um, and accounts payable. So in some businesses, if you're getting paid with a credit card and doing business over the internet, um, you don't have to worry very much about accounts receivable. You'll get your money from the credit card company basically the, uh, on, on a regular basis as, you, uh, as you're booking sales. But if you're in a business where People are coming in and buying a product and going out the door, and particularly if they're commercial customers like um, a landscaper or somebody of that sort, um, they're going to want some credit. And what's common in your business is what you need to provide. So uh, if you're in a business where you need to provide people with uh, 30 days or 60 days worth of credit before they pay the bill, uh, then you have to plan on that, that same thing happening for yourself. So in her business where she's selling uh, trees and shrubs and uh, to uh, to landscapers and uh, uh, and florists and so forth um, she knows that 30% uh, of them are going to pay her within 30 days and another 30% uh, within 60 days and about 40% are going to take their time and uh, so she's hoping that there won't be any bad debts and she's projecting based on what she has has learned in the business herself that uh, she won't have uh, bad debts, may or may not be realistic, depends on the business that you're in. Um, and so uh, that means that she has to think about 
the revenue that she's generating in January, February, March, April, she's not actually going to see the cash until on average, January money on average will, will come in in March uh, and February money will come in in April. A uh, little bit will come in earlier than that. A little bit will come in later, uh, but there's that, that lag. So that's very important for a business in which you're giving people credit. Again, lots of new businesses start when that isn't the case. If you're getting credit cards and so forth, um, you can go and have a cup of coffee while we're talking about this, but come right back because we've got some more stuff to do. Um, accounts payable uh, is uh, another, uh, another thing you have to think about. She herself uh, is going to get credit from her suppliers. And she knows that her suppliers are going to expect her to pay uh, between 30 and 60 days. And so, okay, she's she there's a lag in her, her collections, but there's also a lag in when she has to pay the bill for the products that she buys uh, for her inventory. There is no lag for her for the salaries. She needs that money. She has to make payroll every week. Uh, so that's an important distinction. If you're getting credit from uh, from suppliers, it only applies to the amount of money that goes out the door for the products that you're buying from those suppliers. It doesn't apply to the employee costs. Okay, sources of funding. Where does she get her money? Um, well, Anne has saved um, $115,000. Um, and perhaps she's done that by taking a home equity line or saving money over a period of time, but she's got a chunk of money that she's prepared to put into this. Um, she can get a commercial loan um, because uh, she, uh, from a bank, because she's buying a piece of property and can get a mortgage on it. So she's getting $33,800 in, uh, in uh, uh, a loan and a mortgage, and sorry, another $50,000 in a mortgage uh, and she's got a $15,000 vehicle loan for that $20,000 van that she's buying. And so it adds up to the $213,800 that she needs to start. Uh, so, and let's go back and take a look at that. Uh, so this is the, remember, this is what she needed to get going. She needed $172,000 of fixed assets, including some things on which she can borrow money building, land, um, the vehicle, and so forth, so she can get some credit from a bank. Uh, and uh, she's got these expenses uh, to get off the ground. She has to bring in $30,000 worth of inventory. She needs two thirteen eight hundred. dollars That's where it's coming from. It's really important to do that calculation for yourself. Um, for an existing business, this is the bucket of cash plus receivables that will be turned into cash minus the payables that will be paid out in the near term, that is in the first months of the plan. So you've already got some money uh, in an existing business and there's a piece in the spreadsheet to show you uh, how to put in the cash on hand, the accounts receivable, the prepaid expenses that you have, how much cash you will have available uh, to, uh, uh, to use as a source of funding the business uh, in the next month. So a little simpler uh, if you're an existing, already in business. Okay. So that's where she gets her funds. It matches what her needs were. Um, if it didn't, then she'd have to find some additional funds. Um, now let's go through the cash flow. And this is really the heart of uh, what, uh, what we want you to take away today is uh, this is the sort of the end product. So you remember um, that we started off uh, with Ann's nursery. She has $41,800 on hand. Where does that come from? So let's go back to the very beginning. Of it. This is the operating capital that she needs. This is the fixed assets. Once she spends the money uh, on those fixed assets, she hasn't got any more, but in that, the beginning, she's got $41,800 to start off with. And she's going to sell that $10,000 and that's it. Um, 
And so she'll have total cash receipts of $10,000, that plant mix, you remember that? Um, so she'll have $51,800 uh, before she has to start paying things. And she knows that she's gonna pay her labor, uh, including herself and her taxes and so forth. And that's her uh, payroll and taxes right there. And um, the next sheet we're gonna look at She's got these expenses, $4,300 of operating expenses. And then she's got some additional other expenses, commercial loan. She has to pay uh, some of the uh, principal and interest on that of $704. So she's got $18,511 going out. Now, she only had $10,000 coming in. So very clearly, she's going to have less cash at the end of January than she had at the beginning. And indeed, she's got 33,280 versus the 41,300 or so that she had previously. All right, we're gonna go through this month by month and this is really important to follow this. Um, so in February and March, same thing. And you can see that what happens is she's got that 33,290 left over from January, it goes down in March, it goes down again in April. So she needed, needs that as a cushion, that $15,000 at least as a cushion. And in May, she begins to come up even and begin to accumulate some cash. So let's look at what May is. In May, she figured that she'd have $40,000 worth of plant mix sales and uh, $5,000 worth of those sales on the web. She'd be bringing in $45,000. So she's got 17,112 to begin with, 45. She's got $62,100, $112 of cash um, before she starts paying things out. She's got that labor of 13,507. We're looking at May. She's got the same 4,300 of the fixed operating expenses. She's got some other uh, expenses such as her loan and so forth of uh, 1099 um, and she's uh, paying money down on her line of credit that she borrowed from the bank and so she's got eighteen thousand dollars worth of expenses her cash goes up um, to forty three thousand two hundred and seven uh, at the uh, at the end of uh, the end of May big big improvement so April, similarly, her cash went up a little bit. Um, okay, let's go back to the top of that sheet. Um, and so you can see what's happening here is um, over, over the year, as the year begins to build revenue, she has more and more cash on hand. And she because her sales are going up, and as the sales go up, her cash greatly exceeds uh, the expenses that she has because she finally gets above the break-even point um, and uh, she has a margin, a profit margin on those those three products. After all, we know that she's selling them for more than she paid for them. Um, finally, that profit margin uh, in April, May, April and May adds up to enough uh, so that she more than covers her expenses. And by the end of the year, um, she has $155,000 of cash left, um, she's paid out. Uh, she's brought in a total of 347. She's paid out 162,000 in wages. Um, she's paid out 51,600 in fixed expenses and some other fixed expenses of 13,000. So all of her expenses were 226,960. So if all of her expenses are 226,960, and her sales are 347, she's had a bit over $100,000 in profit. But all of that profit was earned towards the end. There wasn't any profit at the beginning. And at the beginning, she was looking like she was gonna run out of, ca out of cash unless things got going. All right, I wanna stop there and make sure that there aren't any, we've, we've bounced around here uh, between these three spreadsheets, uh, but I wanna make sure that uh, that this is that there aren't any questions about well where does this number come from or how did you do that anyway? 
So I'm just going to wait just a second. If anybody has any questions, put them please into the Q&A. We've got a bunch in the chat, but hopefully. Yeah, there are, there are any um, questions in chat. Um, so, yeah. Okay, I, we'll go then. All right. All right, we'll take a look at the bottom line again and say, boy, that's pretty good. Um, okay, so doing a, a bit of a wrap here. Why bother with this? This is, this is a fair amount of work. Um, it starts with understanding enough about the business so you can do a reasonable sales projection and understand what your costs are going to be. Um, that's probably the most of the work. Putting the spreadsheet together it's just a matter of plugging in the numbers. Um, you have to do the homework first. Uh, and I didn't talk a lot about the homework. I just said, well, here are some sources of information. But please remember that homework is vitally important because the numbers have to be reasonable. They have to be good. Um, and remember that your sales will start very low and build up hopefully during the year uh, to uh, an average level. And the next year, um, you'll start off on a much better footing. So why bother? Well, it, it will tell you whether the business will enable you to reach your personal income goals and knows that she's going to be able to take $4,100 a month out of this business in that first year. She'll be able to take some money out from the profit as well. Um, she may want to reinvest in getting some more land or more inventory or something of that sort, but she'll be able to take some of that profit out for herself. Um, she'll figure out how much money she needs to start up or expand. That's why we start with this in the first place. Um, she'll give a funder, the bank, that she's getting a mortgage from. Sure, they've got land that, you know, they've got uh, land in a building that they're loaning money on and they've got a mortgage and that gives them some security, but they want to see the numbers of the business too. Um, so whether it's family, a nonprofit lender, uh, or a bank, um, they want some information, so you need to do that for them. Mm -hmm. Nonprofit lenders are a source of capital, a source of loans that a lot of people aren't fully aware of, but there are in almost uh, every part of, uh, of metropolitan Boston there, and I think probably in Worcester and Springfield as well, there are neighborhood development corporations. So there's one um, I know uh, I'm very familiar with, the Dorchester Bay Economic Development Corporation, um, and there's one in Jamaica Plain in, in the Boston area. Uh, Jamaica Plain Neighborhood Development Corporation that have funds uh, that they will lend to people who uh, aren't typically able to get a loan from the bank because they haven't been in business long enough. They want to see numbers like this, but they recognize that they will loan to a startup. And there are a couple of other um, startup uh, lenders. There's an organization called Axion East, A-C-C-I-O-N East. That is a nonprofit lender. Uh, and uh, if you talk to a score mentor, they can connect you up or give you information about other nonprofit uh, lenders wherever, uh, geographically, wherever you are in, uh, in the region. Uh, that's not a perfect solution for getting money for a startup, but it's something to remember because it does work for, uh, for some startups. Um, for a bank, you'll need something that the bank knows that they can sell the the reason a bank will give you a loan is that they're confident they'll get that you you'll pay the money back that they'll be able to get their money back um, if they're not confident you won't get a loan uh, but if you have a property that you can mortgage or a collateral that you can put up that's what will make the bank comfortable and if you can show them that you're going to make a profit out of all this at the end they absolutely will require that um, Going through this process will give you an understanding of the risks and rewards. Anne is putting in $115,000 of her own money. Uh, and she's got she's on the hook for those mortgages, although the property uh, that she's bought will uh, will hopefully cover the more than cover the mortgage. Um, she has to, if you've got I if you can identify development and startup costs like she has, um, if you have product development or service development costs, um, that has to go uh, in, into the uh, the startup part of the uh, of the spreadsheet, and um, it provides you with a plan that you can look at. That that last great big spreadsheet uh, that had the cash flow on it, um, you can monitor how you're doing month by month and uh, see whether um, you can 
you can afford to keep your labor full employed or whether you need some more labor if they're beginning to work really hard and you haven't uh, and your sales are growing and they're uh, they're they're no longer able to provide uh, all of the help that you need um, it, it's a way of monitoring uh, what's going on in the business so those are all the reasons why we want you to do this sort of thing okay uh, questions. That's that's it for the formal part. Um, I do is, have some questions. Uh, Can I throw those out? The chat it, is, is the self-employment tax in this uh, in the spreadsheet in the tax part. Um, the self-employment tax is um, what you pay. Let's go. Let's let's go back here. If you have a, a Schedule C business. Uh, uh, or a, li uh, a limited liability corporation in which the profitability flows into your own business, you'll pay a self-employment tax yourself. No, that's not included. That's a personal tax. That's part of your income tax. Uh, the taxes that are included are employee taxes and you are an employee uh, of your business. The self-employment tax is on top of that. Um, the wages question, I think that was the question that we were, that was being asked, but let's see what else. Is there something that uh, Elsie that we should be answering? Uh, I think that's it. The wages question was at the very beginning. Oh. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, how, uh, how do you figure out your own wage? Um, your own wage? Um, well, um, the simple answer is, Honestly, what, what do I need to live on? Uh, and uh, can I, you know, I'm going to tighten my belt here and um, not buy as many Starbucks coffees and maybe make my coffee at home. Uh, but um, uh, what do I what do I need in order to cover my expenses uh, for, for a living? Because you don't want to run up credit card debt or anything of that sort. Um, so that's the money that you need to be drawing out of the business as a minimum uh, in order to keep yourself personally afloat. If the, the if you go through all of this and it the number doesn't come out in a way that will uh, you're, that that will yield enough money for you, don't do it. Don't go into this business. Figure out how to fix that, um, or don't do it at all. Uh, I will give you a, a bit of an a, 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 an anecdote from when I when, when I first joined Score. Um, someone came in um, uh, to talk to me about. Uh, about buying a dry cleaning business and his family was going to work in the dry cleaning business and he was expecting that he'd be supporting the family and because he was buying the business he needed I think the business was being sold for 70 or eighty thousand dollars something like that and we sat down and figured out um, what the profit was going to be what was left over um, after his expenses uh, and uh, see what um, uh, what revenue he was going to be able to take out for his for his family's wages, and it turned out that it wasn't enough uh, to cover it. And when he saw that, he thought, uh, "I better not do this." Uh, that's why I came in to work it out, uh, and he didn't. Uh, so, okay, that was uh, avoiding a problem. Uh, doing this kind of work will help you avoid that problem. And one of the key ingredients is how much money do I need to live on. So that was a long answer to that question, but uh, it's an important one. Okay, any other questions? Uh, I don't, yeah, I don't think there are. Okay, good. We're right about on time and yeah. that's great. Okay, thank you well, all very much. yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you everyone for joining us today.